Hello and welcome to this technique tutorial. My name is Samantha Wilchire and today I'm going to be introducing you to some options um, and methods for construction. So we're going to be applying these methods to drawing as an example today and uh, discussing them in the context of drawing. Um, however, you could absolutely apply any of these methods um, to an underdrawing for a painting, to an underpainting, um, to a mock-up sketch that you might be using to design a, a print. Um, so really for any medium, these skills could be applicable. Uh, and this is going to be a part of a larger video series, um, which covers these methods of construction in more detail with practical activities Some options, that you can participate um, and in methods yourself. For construction. So I would recommend uh, after you watch this video to uh, continue and watch the rest of this construction series. That way you can try out a few different techniques and understand what will be um, best applied to your own personal practice. Uh, and you'll be able to see here that in this introductory slide, I have an example of my own construction that was starting to progress into the tonal work stage. Um, and you'll be able to see that I have used nice clean lines. I've looked at those nice big shapes to begin with, and then I've built these smaller details in on top. But I always in my practice like to work from big to small and I apply a number of these different techniques and I'll be mentioning the ways that I combine some of these myself as an example as we go through. But please remember that there's not a right and a wrong way to construct. Um, it's a very personal thing that you develop for your own practice through trial and error. Um, so here's our workshop overview today. Uh, first, we're going to be going through why your construction matters so much. Why should you really take your time to perfect your personal construction process? Um, then we're going to be introducing a few different methods, and those methods include the envelope method, the simple shapes method, the robot method, the gridding and chunking method, and also experimental construction processes. Um, we'll then be concluding and going through some further activities that you might like to try in your own time. And for this workshop today, you're not going to need any of your materials. Uh, this video is a theory-based video where we'll be going through um, the different options. If you would like to participate in practical activities and follow along with me, you can do so in those uh, other construction videos, which will also be released. Our lesson objectives for today, um, we are going to be learning the variety of options that are available to us uh, when we produce that underneath construction or scaffolding. And we're also going to learn how to diagnose problems in, drawing and, uh, in drawings and find solutions. So there will be a video on problem solving for art in its own right that will be uh, released. But anytime we talk about construction, we are talking uh, at its core about that initial process of resolving all of those issues uh, that are to do with proportion, that are to do with tone, that are to do with achieving a sense of three dimension. Um, so all of what we do in construction is problem solving. And we will be touching on that in this video also. Uh, and all of these skills are useful for a number of the following reasons. They're going to help you to develop more of a likeness and greater realism in your art making, if that is your goal. Um, they're going to allow you to understand shape and three dimension uh, in a more detailed way. They're going to help you to learn to see in brand new ways. Um, I'm hoping that you're going to, after watching this video, go out into the world and be walking down the street and looking at the things around you and wondering to yourself, or how would I go about constructing that? Um, we're going to be understanding where to begin when you want to draw something new. And that can actually be really intimidating. That sounds very basic, but sometimes it's hard to know how to get the wheel rolling. Um, we're going to be improving the efficiency of our drawing process through these skills. So as you practice these construction methods, at first they're going to feel really long and tedious and difficult, um, but as you do them more and more, they will become easier and it will uh, create better drawings much faster. Um, and as we mentioned previously, we'll also, as a part of all of this, be learning how to find and address proportion problems as we go. And so the reason that all of this is necessary is because um, your drawing uh, will 
will be set by your construction. It's it's the foundation. It sets the tone for the the finished product. Um, and so we want to begin with confidence, and we want to feel from the very beginning um, that this is going to be a successful result. And that helps to motivate and propel us throughout the rest of that drawing process as well. Um, and when we put more time and effort into that scaffolding and construction, it saves us from finding problems later during the shading and tonal work stage, um, which are really hard to correct once, especially those really dark tones are laid down. So um, I want to put you through a little bit of pain now to save you a lot of pain in the future when those issues um, kind of arise and you realize, oh no, I should have actually spent a lot more time correcting these proportion problems earlier in the process. Uh, and the great thing is once we learn these rules, we can break them. So knowing how to construct empowers you to decide for yourself how, when, and if you're going to integrate these skills into your practice. Uh, and the first most important thing that I think we should all know about construction is that there's not a right and a wrong way to construct. I see a whole variety of different um, types of construction in my classroom all the time. And in particular, I see two main um, directions that people lean. People often lean in either a messier direction or a very neat direction. And it is kind of a scale. A lot of people sit somewhere in between. Um, but I wanted to begin by going through the pros and the cons of both, in particular for messy construction, because I think some people have a bit of a negative impression of messy drawing constructions. And it's completely unnecessary because there's a lots of benefits to being a little bit more messy. Um, one of the first benefits is that it can be more gestural, expressive, and contemporary. So if you're a messy constructor, you're in very good company because a lot of contemporary artists are wanting to experiment with form and texture and with mark making and uh, your construction can actually be a part of that as well. Um, messy construction can help us to capture a sense of movement or character that maybe we wouldn't be able to achieve with um, such a uh, kind of rigorous and um, even stiff neat drawing process, it might not actually capture the speed or the activity that's occurring in the drawing. Um, messy construction may also have a rough quality that enhances your style. So it could become a part of your identity and what's unique to you as an artist. Uh, messy construction is a very fast process uh, and does allow for more experimentation. And the best thing is that it's also not necessarily any less accurate than neat construction. It just depends on your approach. Um, so we can be very messy in our construction, but we can apply very sophisticated measuring techniques and techniques for understanding form and three dimension that are still going to allow us to, to end up with an accurate um, and very impressive artwork. Um, some of the benefits of neat construction are that uh, it can create less confusion and less line tangles. So oftentimes in my classroom, I call it line spaghetti. Um, and that's where we have so many scaffolding or construction lines overlapping each other that we actually lose sight of which are our correct lines and which were lines we had wanted to erase or shade over or remove later. Um, and that can actually create proportion issues in itself and also just a lot of unnecessary frustration and confusion. Um, neat construction is also often but not always very meticulous and may sometimes result in a higher level of accuracy. But again, this completely depends on the level of measuring that you apply and on the other tools that you use alongside being neat and tidy. I've definitely seen some drawings which are very neat and tidy, but not at all very accurate because they haven't been using those measuring processes. Um, Neat construction may also give you a little bit of a better sense of control over the composition in general. And that kind of feeds into that um, idea of line spaghetti, having a little bit uh, less to work with and really taking your time throughout that process and being very methodical um, can create a, a sense of being really the author of your own work rather than having to compromise um, with whatever lines may occur whether they were spur of the moment or, or well thought through. Um, 
And neat construction, it also prevents the page itself from becoming dirtied and hard to work with. So, um, and that's especially the case in lighter tonal areas. So when we have line spaghetti going on or when we have a lot of maybe scribbly construction and we've also been quite heavy handed with it as well, um, which I wouldn't ever recommend in construction, I would always recommend being a little bit lighter. What can happen is that the, uh, the material that we're using can become so embedded into the, the tooth or the grain of the paper itself that we actually can't lift it. And then we can't achieve lights that are as light as we need them to be to create the contrast that we're looking for and to create that illusion of three dimension. And that's always really frustrating. Um, so let's start by talking about the envelope technique, remembering that you can have a, a neat or a messy approach to any of these techniques. Um, and remembering also that sometimes we can take bits and pieces from one technique with bits and pieces of another technique and kind of splice them together and pick and choose. Uh, so the envelope technique um, is, in my experience, one of the most effective methods for construction, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, the first reason is because it breaks down three dimension into two dimensional shapes in a really simple way. So what the envelope method entails um, is, as Anthony Ryder demonstrates in this excerpt from his book, The Artist's Complete Guide to Figure Drawing, um, it involves using uh, lines so diagonal and straight lines to encase whatever it is that you're drawing. It could be a figure, it could be a teapot, it doesn't matter what, um, in this envelope shape. And that shape is going to be different depending on what you draw. So each outward extremity of your person should be joined by these lines. Now, a mistake I see often is people dipping in and going um, downwards. We don't want to do that. We, we really just want to create an overall sense of the space that the subject occupies. Um, and then once we've done that, we can uh, chop into this shape with other lines. Um, in particular, I love to use diagonals to construct. And you can see that Anthony Wright has begun this process. And I've come in with a blue digital drawing tool. And I've actually added some more to demonstrate how I would then continue to break this person down into really basic, uh, very uh, kind of cubist looking, sharp edged, uh, simple shapes. Um, and then I can come in and I can make it curvy and pretty later. Uh, so that's the benefit. It, it really just allows you to have a starting point to then proceed to break it down into those shapes. Um, this is also a great method because it can be really easily combined with a consideration of other tools and techniques. So we can use comparative measuring, which we'll go through in a future video. Um, we can also use an axis, so a, a division line down the middle to help us with that measuring. Um, we can use uh, we can use landmarking. We can use a whole variety of these techniques, which you'll be introduced to throughout this series, um, uh, to kind of lend itself further to this envelope technique. Um, this technique is also really great because it allows you to consider negative and positive space for greater accuracy. Um, so, what I mean by negative and positive space uh, is the space that your subject occupies and the space that everything else occupies. So here is my woman, she is my subject and anything that is background within this envelope, that is my negative space. And I've gone on top of a uh, writer's diagram here with a yellow highlighter tool and I've highlighted that negative space so that it's nice and obvious. Um, now this matters because um, I want to be able to see that not only the shapes of my body are correct, but the shapes around them are correct. If the shapes around the body parts aren't correct, you can probably bet that there's been something that's gone wrong in the proportion of the body itself. So it is a way of checking your accuracy as you go. Um, so I can say to myself, well, this arm is a triangle and this piece of negative space is a rectangle. And it doesn't matter if this triangle looks correct. If there's a rectangle next to it doesn't also look to be the correct shape and size, then I know that there's something that's gone wrong that I'll need to investigate further. Um, and this is also really good when you have a very cluttered composition. Maybe you're doing a still life with a lot of objects. Not only do you need to consider those objects, but you need to consider the spaces in between them and their relationships with each other in that space. And this process forces you to do that. 
Um, another benefit of this process is that it ensures that since you start with your big envelope, um, that you're going to fit your entire subject onto your page. And that just gives you a greater level of control over your composition. So all the time I see people, they jump into a face or a torso and they're happily drawing away and then they get to the bottom of their page and go, oh no, I've got to crop my subject in a really funny place um, on my page that I hadn't hoped for. And it's because they've scaled the entire drawing uh, too much up or too much down, or they placed it too far to one side or the other or too far up and down on their page. And so when I start with this envelope, I ensure that no matter what, I'm going to be able to fit my entire drawing into that space. The next method of construction you might want to consider using, um, perhaps also with that envelope technique, all by itself, if you would prefer, is the simple shapes method. Um, so what, what we do in the simple shapes method is we break down whatever we're drawing into those simple geometric shapes. And there's a few categories of shapes we generally use. We might use circles, ovals, and ellipses. We might use squares, rectangles, rhombus, parallelograms, triangles, or trapeziums. Um, and we don't necessarily have to use all of those. I've put these little shapes up here. These are all of the shapes that were mentioned below. And um, usually when I construct, I very rarely use um, my ellipses and circles uh, until a little bit later towards the end. Um, or when I do construct them, I actually construct them inside the box. So if I'm drawing a circle, I'm actually going to start with a rectangle uh, I'm going to check that that's the right dimensions and then I'll actually put my circle inside of it for a better level of accuracy. You'll be able to see that this artist over here, Lance Richland, in his book Drawing Made Easy, Lifelike Heads, has used a ton of ellipses, circles and ovals in his construction. In this image over here, though, um, that I've taken from Draw Really Cool Stuff by Hinkler Books, um, I've taken this little cuttlefish and I've used the simple shapes method to break down without using any uh, ellipses, circles or ovals whatsoever because I'll be able to come back in and I'll be able to turn this now very rectilinear uh, kind of cubist looking cuttlefish into a nice curvilinear organic cuttlefish by softening those edges once I'm sure that the dimensions themselves are correct. Um, and so we can apply this uh, either all over the form that we're drawing, or this might be something you choose to use um, as a way to correct yourself uh, if you discover that there are problems as you go. Personally, I prefer the process of using this from the beginning so that I can avoid making those problems in the first place, but other people feel that they like to be a little bit more free. So another process that we could use alongside our simple uh, two-dimensional shape method is a three-dimensional simple geometry um, in perspective method. And I have a tutor friend called Christina who loves to call this the robot method. Um, and the reason is because, especially in portraiture, you do end up with a person that looks a little bit like Iron Man. They do look very robotic until you can come in and smooth them all out. Um, so rather than using a two-dimensional trapezium uh, in order to create this nose in this uh, image right here, um, what Rudy De Reyna has done in his book, uh, How to Draw What You See, he's, he's thought about the nose as being not just a trapezium, but a trapezium-based prism. So the trapezium makes up the little bottom of our nose, but then he's acknowledged that there's these planes on the side and on the top on that bridge of our nose as well. And by thinking about these shapes um, in perspective, almost like we're building a person's face out of children's blocks, um, we can really create the feeling of a nose sticking out and having that sense of three dimension. And that's important because everything we see um, that is out in the world that isn't a flat image that we've produced is a three-dimensional thing. And we need to be able to create a sense of that and to create that illusion in our drawing process. Um, so this is really effective to use on faces and bodies in particular, um, but also we're going to use three-dimensional geometry in perspective any time that we do a still life, any time. Because if I have a vase, um, I need to think about, well, what is the shape of that vase's base? 
Is it an ellipse? How can I create that shape so that the structure of my vase is going to look correct and it's got not going to look like it's wonky? Um, so we can apply this anywhere, but in particular, still life faces and bodies. Another method that a lot of people use is the gridding and chunking down method. Now, I'm going to be really, really honest. I'm not a huge fan of the gridding and chunking down method. And the reason for that is because I find that a lot of people um, end up with quite clunky and ever so slightly disjointed looking drawings. And a lot of the time that occurs because they've made the mistake of doing the construction in the box and then doing the tonal work of that box before moving to the next box and constructing and then doing the tonal work in that next box. Um, and that means that because we're thinking of it on such a small scale, we're not understanding and realizing our composition as an entire artwork. I would far prefer, um, at least for my students, that you uh, create the body in its entirety before then going in and um, starting to do tonal work. Uh, and because it's a problem we have all the time when we're looking this close, when we're looking at a minute thing and then we scale out, we realise there was a whole variety of problems that we could have seen earlier if we had taken the time to think about it as a full composition um, a bit earlier on in the construction process. Uh, but gridding can be useful. It can be useful to use um, in relationship with other methods as well. And some people swear by it and use it exclusively. Um, so what it does is it, it basically simplifies what you're seeing into small boxes. And that's a running theme throughout this video. All of these processes at their core are designed to simplify whatever it is that we're seeing. Um, and so uh, what we can also do with gridding processes sometimes is projection. So you, you may actually often see artists um, projecting a grid onto a onto an image onto a canvas um, you'll see artists have gridded up their reference picture and then gridded up their uh, their page or their canvas um, and they'll be able to flick their eyes back and forth and it helps them to kind of play a game of spot the difference and to be able to see um, where their work is off compared to their reference picture And the last method I wanted to touch on today is the experimental or free construction method. Um, so a lot of contemporary artists might even use scribble like John Raines has in his book, Complete Anatomy and Figure Drawing. He's actually used scribble uh, within his construction process to help him to find some of the form. And this is a really nice in particular for hair, for fabric, for bodies that are in motion. Um, and there's a number of benefits to doing this. So first of all, it feels a little bit more organic, feels a little bit less stiff and robotic than the processes that we've just discussed. Um, it can also help you to sometimes abstract. You might actually not care about accurate proportion. Maybe you just care about um, catching a likeness or a character. And so um, if you're abstracting in your construction phase, um, you're more likely to be able to maintain that throughout the entire drawing or painting rather than doing a technical drawing first and then trying to force yourself to think outside of the box and to um, edit that after you've done all that um, all of that hard work. Uh, so some of the other things that we could do other than abstraction and scribble to create a, an experimental construction might be to use an eraser on a surface that might be colored black and finding the shapes from the highlights first. So maybe rather than constructing with a line, you're actually going to construct with tone. Um, you could also uh, produce a blind drawing. So some artists actually experiment with looking at the subject and never looking at the drawing until it's finished. And they do end up being very abstract. It's, it's a lot of fun. If you've never done it before, you should give it a go. Um, that also kind of feeds into artists who might experiment with continuous line drawing. So they might place their pen down on their page and start their construction. Um, and what they will do is they will actually never lift their pen. So when they want to move on to another area of the body or whatever they're drawing, they'll have to continue a line in that direction rather than lifting. And that also creates some quite unique and interesting and experimental results. 
Um, and other artists also might experiment even with a more minimal approach. So we've looked at experimental drawing so far in terms of um, kind of scribbling and having quite a lot of texture perhaps going on. But we could also tone that right down and we could try and construct using as few lines as we possibly can to create the feeling of a person's body. Um, and that would be a really interesting thing to play with in your practice as well if you've never tried that before. The last um, area that we sometimes see in construction is people who use various different types of image transfer. Um, and it's, it's really common to hear people express the opinion that projection, um, so projecting uh, an image using light onto a canvas to assist you with your painting, um, or image transfer as construction is cheating. People call it cheating all the time. I think it's important, however, to acknowledge that as artists, we have a whole variety of new tools and mediums and techniques and technologies that are worth experimenting with. And many of the artists who use image transfer methods do so in a highly experimental and sophisticated way. Even artists that just project or trace often still continue their artistic process and apply a high level of skill and conceptual thinking to their work on top of that. Um, and usually they're still measuring, they're still applying other processes. They might just be using um, that initial starting point of an image transfer as a guide. Uh, and some of the different types of image transfer might include using something like a Vermeer drawing machine or a mirror machine, uh, which is really fascinating. If you've never seen it, you should watch the documentary Tim's Vermeer, um, which I have a cover picture of right here. Um, and you should see how it is that we suspect Vermeer was producing his drawings using optical illusion as a part of his process. And here I am having a go at it myself. I've got a uh, ruler duct taped to a water, uh, a water bottle and I've got a mirror from like a makeup uh, powder compact that I've taped to that ruler. And then I've put my reference picture um, taped to a box upside down and I've reflected that image and then I've looked down onto that mirror onto the reflection and use that to guide my drawing process it's a little bit complicated to understand just from a verbal explanation so I would definitely recommend going and watching um, this documentary or videos of other people trying that online to understand what that is uh, you may also see people utilizing transfer paper um, or gesso and glue image transfer. So you can actually print out images and if you have the right sort of paper, you can actually stick them to a surface um, with some gesso or some glue. And then if you actually wet your fingers with some water and rub, uh, the paper will pill and all of that white paper will come off and you'll be left with the colored image that was stuck face down into that gesso or that glue. And that can be quite uh, fun to experiment with if you're interested in collage um, or if you're interested in uh, the integration of other images into your construction process. You'll see people all the time using projectors and tracing paper as a means of um, getting their basic big shapes down first rather than measuring and trying to see them um, initially just with your naked eye. They might want a little bit more assistance with that. And sometimes artists who can do both might use this as a starting point if they want to speed up their practice, perhaps if they have a backlog of commission work or, or something of that nature that they need to get through, they might fall back on image transfer just to get some initial starting lines, even maybe just one or two. Um, and there's also all types of various different collage and mixed media processes that might factor into using image transfer techniques. Um, and so I would encourage you to form an opinion. What do you think? Do you think that image transfer uh, or projection is cheating? Why or why not? Would you use it in your own practice? What could be the pros and cons? Um, this would be a fantastic conversation to write about in your visual arts process diary. And that now brings us to the end of our summary of some of the different types of construction that are available. I have here the references from my uh, research and my images that were included today. Um, and here's some opportunities that you could pursue uh, next. What you could do to start with is research the practices of some of your artists of influence. How do the artists that you admire construct their drawings or paintings? Um, that's a really helpful way to get started. 
Uh, you could also continue to watch the construction demo video series produced by Sydney Art School and practice each of these processes to understand what suits your practice best. Uh, and you can create a personal pros and cons list as you attempt each type of construction to help you to come to those decisions. Uh, and our long-term goal today is that we want to have a go at each method to form an understanding of our own personal practice and hopefully also build some efficiency as we do so. Thank you so much for watching today and happy art making.